At the very beginning of Python 3, uh, there was a project called Python 3000. Uh, it was in 2006. It, was, it started with a PEP, uh, the PEP 3000 called Python 3000. And the idea was to, to focus on what is called Python warts, um, because um, Python 2 got more and more users, and slowly start, people started to complain about some design issues. And this is design issues um, started to be collected as a list, and they were called the Python warts. For example, in Python 2, you have two different types for integers. You have the long integer and the small integer. And depending on the value of the number, depending on the operation, you may get a small or large integer. And in that case, to test the type of a variable, you have to test for both types at the same time. Um, and this can be surprising for newcomers. They may not understand why we have two different things for the same kind of uh, value, a number. There, there is also something called new class. Uh, it's a new addition during the Python 2 development. The new class um, should be used to, to get new features, like, for example, Python properties. If you don't use a new class, the properties don't, go, don't work as expected. And again, it's a little bit surprising that you have to inherit explicitly from the object type to get the new class. And it's surprising for new newcomers. For the division of two integer in Python 2, uh, you get an integer. This was a choice made as from the beginning of Python. But uh, when Python became more and more popular, some people were surprised by that they didn't get a float because in other languages, on using a simple calculator, you get a float. So it has been decided to change that to always return a float because uh, there is already an operator in Python 2. It's instead of a single slash, you put a double slash and you always get an integer. For the Unicode, um, in short, I would say that if you only use bytes, you're fine. If all your inputs, all your outputs, uh, all data inside your application are bytes, there is no, no issue. But if you, st if you use Unicode as inputs, outputs, uh, Unicode everywhere in your application, you are also fine. But you start to get some, some uh, nasty issues when you have uh, bytes and Unicode in your same application. Especially, you don't get errors all the time, but only if a single character has an accent. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to debug such issue. It may happen in production and uh, more and more people uh, were angry uh, against this design. For the comparison, uh, Python 2 again made a choice from the beginning, is that you are always able to compare two to, to variables in Python 2. It means that uh, if some, some object doesn't make any sense for a comparison, Python takes the name of the type and compares the name. For example, if you compare the string hello and the number three, you get the, the string str for the type st string, and you get the string int for the number three, and you compare these two values to decide how to order values. And uh, this behavior can be surprising and maybe not the one that you may expect. So we also decided to change that and not try to guess, but raise a type error in Python 3. It means that in Python 3, you, you have to make it very explicit. And finally, for the import, um, another trap for newcomers is that if you have a, um, a module which has the same name than a module of the standard library, like the sys module, you get a conflict between the module from the standard library and in your project. Because Python decided to use something called relative imports, which means that you, you can import a module in the same directory without having to specify the full path to the module. So again, we wanted to change that to always use absolute imports, which means that you always have to write the full path to the module to avoid such uh, name conflict. So um, to make sure that uh, Python 3 is not going to be a, a big mistake, uh, from the uh, very beginning of the project, we tried to, to have something called risk management to not break everything. 
And the idea is that to only change uh, acknowledged words, so only um, the very short list of design issues. And we also decided to have an open community uh, process to decide what should be changed. And the process uh, where the PEP, PEP uh, with a number starting with a number starting with 3,000. And we also decided to not re-implement Python from scratch, the C Python, the implementation of the language. Uh, it's not done from scratch, but it's just a fork from Python 2. Again, it's to limit the number of uh, subtle changes that you may get if you do it from scratch. And for, again, from the very beginning, we decided to put an, uh, a deadline for Python 2. Uh, at the beginning, it was 2015, I think, to, to, to say that you're, today you are fine with Python 2, but be prepared that at this time you will, you will have to switch. And in 2008, the holy grail, <laughs> Python 2, the first release. Can you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> the holy grail. <laughs> And it, it was 10 years ago. <laughs> and the first migration pla plan was very, very simple. You take your, your whole application, all dependencies, everything. You run a, a, an application called 2 to 3 to convert your Python 2 code base to Python 3 and done. OK, uh, maybe it was not that easy in practice. Maybe there are some practical issues. Uh, because the thing is that when you have a third party dependency, the author of the module maybe don't want to drop all the Python 2 user base because uh, when you run 2 to 3, you, you lose Python 2 support. And uh, when Python 3 has been released, Python 3 was a new thing. It was not uh, supported by a Linux distribution, for example. It was not installed uh, by, by most users. It was really something very new. So many users did not want to hear anything about Python 3. And uh, another practical issue is that uh, even if you succeed to port uh, a dependency to Python 3, it's not enough. You really have to port all your dependencies on dependency of dependency of dependency of. Uh, and um, so, you cannot start to port your, your own application before you port, you port dependencies. So it takes a lot of time just to start on your own code. And uh, another, bad, another bad or good surprise is that uh, we didn't know that Python 2 was so much popular and it was heavily used in production. To, to explain you another problem called technical depth, imagine um, that you are talking with your manager and your manager asks, why should I let you work on Python 3 support? And the developer say, for all these new cool Python 3 features. And manager, OK, but can I use all these features? Well, still, so we still have to support Python 2? No. Um, because um, when you support Python 2 and Python 3 in the same code base, Technically, you cannot use Python 3 features because uh, you, you have to support Python 2. So the, um, you, you can spend a lot of time to port everything, but at the end, you don't get any kind of direct benefit from the ports. So you have to spend a lot of time for, for no gain. And it's difficult to justify if you have a, a manager on top of you. <clears throat> if you would like to port Python, an application to Python 3, you have different options to, for the code base. Um, for example, you can decide to have two different branches in Git. And um, one example is that the DNS Python project has been forked. Uh, there were two different projects, DNS Python for Python 2 and DNS Python 3 for Python 3. Sometimes uh, the maintainer of the project doesn't care about Python 3 because, for example, of the Harry manager. And uh, so the community decided to fork the project. For example, the PIL module has been forked as Pillow. It's a module to manipulate pictures, to resize and do whatever you want with pictures. And not only they added Python 3 support, but they also added new features, which is really cool. 
And uh, in the worst case, uh, you are stuck by a dependency like MySQL Python. I was working on OpenStack and all OpenStack rely on this module. But the maintainer decided to not reply to any uh, bug reports. Uh, he didn't reply to pull requests. So we were stuck and we didn't know what to do. So someone decided to maybe just fork the project and then put it on as a new name. But then you get a new issue is that um, for our Linux vendors like uh, Red Hat, we didn't know if we should rely on the old version or the new version because we don't know uh, if the old version is going to die or maybe it's going to be maintained for the the, the decided to the maintainer decided to to wake up. And to to give you an idea of what was Python 2 at this time, you have to know that when Python 3 has been released, uh, the stable version of Python 2 uh, was 2.6. And um, the issue with Python 2.6 is that you have to to make a lot of changes to make your code compatible with Python 3. For example, for all your Dinkle string, um, we you, we add uh, the u prefix to annotate the new Dinkle string. But if you do that, you get a syntax error in Python 3. So to be able to have a single code base for Unicode string, you have to remove the prefix and, you, and call a function from the 6 module. So you have to, you, to write 6.u parentheses your string. Uh, it was a little bit annoying to do that on all your string. And because of that, some project just, just decided to not, not uh, do anything for Python 3. And another issue is that if you really want to use new Python 3 features, like the new method of the unit test module, you can use something called uh, unit uh, backports, like unit test 2, <laughs> which backports new features from Python 3. But it can be an issue to have dependency because uh, 10 years ago it was a little bit difficult to install all dependency and take care of, um, of, of that. It was um, more difficult to install it. So we had to wait um, up, up to Python up to Python 3.2. You had the U issue, and you have to wait for the next release to to get a fix for that. So after Auton comes the cold winter time, and we will start with a website called the Python 3 Wall of Shame. So in 2011, uh, someone decided to create a, a website called Python 3 Wall of Shame. But the idea was not to blame uh, the author of the modules. The intent was to motivate package maintainer to port their code to Python 3. But when the website has been created, only 9% uh, of the top 200 modules were compatible with Python 3. And um, to, to recall what was Python 10 years ago, we had uh, identified three big players in the Python community. Uh, there is a Tristed, which is a, a very good uh, networking solution for clients on server to do asynchronous programming, which is a very efficient way to do networking in Python. Uh, there is Mercurial, which is similar to Git. It's a source control management. Uh, and there is also uh, Django, it's a very famous framework to do websites. And uh, this free project had different, uh, had different issues with Python 3. Twisted and Mercurial are very close to the, to the hardware, to the low level. For example, Twisted works on the socket level, and at the socket level, the network level, there is nothing called Unicode, there, is, there are only bytes. So all the project is designed to use bytes. And uh, in Python 3, using bytes is not the first citizen class um, type. Uh, we prefer to use Unicode, so at the beginning it was a little bit difficult to twist it to port the code base to Python 3. And uh, it's the same issue for Mercurial because they used bytes not only for the file name for very good reason, but also for the file content. Or for these two reasons, it was also difficult, and it's still difficult to Mercurial to be ported to Python 3. And for Django, uh, when Python 3 has been released, uh, the support of Unicode was only at the beginning. So because it, it was very difficult to port code, because nobody wanted to be the first one to port code, we started to, to see this Frenchman who is a Python troll. And the Python troll considered that 
Python 3 doesn't bring anything because as I explained uh, with the manager, when you port code to Python 3, it, you, you still have the same features. You, it doesn't bring anything. And uh, is, when you move to Python 3, you are forced to use properly Unicode. And nobody wants to do that because it's very difficult for good reason. And uh, it's much more simpler to use Python 2 with bytes because you don't have to worry about Unicode, uh, people speaking a different language. Just pass text and it works. So Python, Python 2 is a failure. So maybe what we can do is just, just continue the development of Python 2.7. So there is an idea uh, from the trolls is that maybe we just we can just continue the development and create a new version called 2.8 to add new features from Python 3, but don't break the backward compatibility. Um, but, and uh, four years ago, there was still an article saying that uh, we were still debating uh, transitional Python 2.8, and they were concerned that Py Python 3 would never take off and also that Python 3 only represents 2% of packages. To, to, make, to make things more explicit, uh, we, we wrote a pep called the pep not found, the 404. <laughs> it's a Python 2.8 unreleased schedule. So it's a very obvious, uh, a very explicit document to say that we, we know that we are breaking the backward compatibility, but we are not going to spend more time on Python 2 because we are, we are a small team of core developers. We don't have enough time to maintain two versions. And uh, if you use the numbers differently, in 2013, uh, someone else counted that there are 80% of the top 50 projects which were compatible with Python 3. So it wasn't that bad. And um, Python 2.7 has, has his uh, end of life extended at the um, PyCon in 2014. And for me, it's one of the best moves that we did for Python 3, is that we, we say that, okay, we know that it's difficult to port your code. You, you have very good reason to not port your code today because not all dependencies are compatible because it, it costs a lot of money and we don't want to force people to move to Python 3. We didn't want to force people to do anything, so we just say that you, you have four more, five more years to do your work and uh, we extended the, the deadline to 2020. So after the cold winter comes fresh air, flowers, it's a new beginning. And the first great move for Python is that our first pr problem has been solved. So what is our first problem? Is that um, when you wanted to install a dependency, um, which was a very common question because using dependency is a good, is a good practice, the question is, how can I install a dependency? And the answer was, oh, you have to install scepter tools. OK, but how can I uh, install scepter tools? <laughs> And it was a little bit difficult because you had to find um, a, a script somewhere on the internet, do, download the script. You, you need the system administrator permission to be able to run the script. It does install something on your system. It's, it's not from the system, it's from the, from the internet, so you have to trust it. Uh, it was not the perfect solution. But in 2011, uh, PIP 1.0 has been released. And uh, in 2014, we decided to include not pip itself, but ensure pip, which is a new module to install pip directly into Python. So in Python 2.7.9 and Python 3.4, there is no uh, ensure pip to, to be installed to very easily install pip. In practice, even if you don't have in the internet connection to the internet, you are still able to, use, to install pip using that. And uh, thanks to this, this change, uh, slowly PIP became the de facto installer. And you don't have to answer how to install dependency. You just know that PIP is a, the correct way to do that. And um, we also see a Linux distribution to include PIP directly in the system. So today, it's very easy to, to have dependencies. 
to port an application to Python 3, uh, we saw that 2 to 3 was not the best approach. So what we saw is that maybe we should not remove Python 2 support, but say, say differently, like add Python 3 support. And this is a big, big um, change because you don't lose your users, you only move to Python 3 step by step and you don't have to force all your dependency, all your code base at once. You can start with a simple change and, uh, or a single file and do it incrementally. And we started to see new tools like uh, Modernize. It's a tool to convert your code base without losing the Python 2 support. And uh, let me tell you the story of Sixer, which is my own tool. So I, I'm working up on OpenStack, and uh, on OpenStack, if you send a pull request uh, generated by Modernize, you get a giant pull request, and uh, you are sure that in a few hours you will get a conflict, because OpenStack is moving very quickly, and uh, all files are modified, so it's really difficult to, to get a pull request, pull request with no conflict for longer than one day, especially a very large pull request. So what I did is to write a new tool uh, which only apply a selected operation, like for example, just add parentheses to the print statement. And by doing that, you can generate much smart, smarter, um, smaller pull request. Uh, you get less conflicts, and uh, it's much more easier to review also for the maintainer, because you see that the change only add parentheses, so it's a simple change and it's easy to approve. And thanks to this tool, I was able to post uh, all unit tests to of OpenStack to Python 3. And um, another good um, um, advantage of this, this method is that if you are CI to validate all your work, you can make, sh you can make sure that each change doesn't break the, the backward compatibility. It doesn't introduce regression. So you can apply st changes one by one and make sure that everything is fine. If you have a larger code base, uh, maybe you, you need uh, to do it differently um, because some companies are v have very, very large code base, like for example, Instagram or Dropbox have at least two million lines of code. So what they need to do is that uh, when you have a very, very large code base, what, what you can do is first to add new tests. Because sometimes in a big company, people uh, like to add new features, but they just forget to add new tests. So adding a new test is a good practice for your existing code base, but it also helps to make sure that the, the, the migration doesn't break anything. And Dropbox is also trying to a different approach. Um, they decided to work on the type annotation. <coughs> the idea is that you annotate the type of the uh, arguments of your function, but also the return type of your function. And by doing that, they expect that it will be much easier to parse the application to Python 3 without uh, introducing bugs. Because if you have a type annotation, you know which type are expected, and it's much more easier to make sure to validate everything. To make the migration simpler, um, we, we made the different changes in uh, Python itself, but also in tooling around Python. And uh, the first big change is that in 2012, we decided to reintroduce the U prefix. Even if it doesn't make sense, if you only look at the Python free language to have this U prefix, because all strings are Unicode by default, Adding the U prefix was very useful to write a single code base for Python 2 and Python 3. So it fixed a lot of uh, issues to, 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 force, to help people to import their code. In 2015, um, Python 3.7 has been released with a new operator for bytes. Um, it's a way to format a byte string. This is very useful for projects like Twisted or Mercurial which manipulates a lot of bytes. Um, and we also added more Python, Python uh, 3000 warnings, so Python 3 warnings. We added these warnings in Python 2. So the idea is that even if you don't port anything, just enable the warning, and uh, you, will, you will see which code may, may have some troubles on Python 3, and you have to first focus on this code 
before starting the big migration plan. And um, to, to be able to use Python free features, we saw more and more backports of Python free features to Python 2. For example, the unit test 2, enum 3.4, which is a new enum module. And uh, thanks to all these backports, um, moving to Python 3 really, really had some, something. And after the spring comes the summertime. So to come back to, to the website, The Wall of Shame, the author of the website decided to change the title from Wall of Shame to Wall of Superpower. <laughs> and uh, today, we, we got al almost 100% uh, of the module which are um, compatible with Python 3. In practice, it's a little bit less. It's only 90% um, 5 because in this long list, you have some modules which have, have been replaced by new new modules yeah, because the, the old module doesn't make sense on, on Python 3 or the maintainer decided to restart from scratch. So in this list, you have some modules which um, which you can just ignore and you can consider that the top 200 modules on PyPI are compatible with Python 3. And another good news for Python 3 is that uh, finally, after a long process, a long development process, we had enough time to to optimize Python Python 3, and Python 3 is now faster than Python 2. Uh, on this on graphic, you can see the um, result of a few benchmark, and the orange line is the um, normalized result of Python 2. So it's always one, and if the other bar is lower, it means that Python Python 3 is faster. And you can see that uh, depending, depending on the um, benchmark, it's more or less uh, faster, and in some cases, it's way faster. To, to give you these numbers differently, uh, there is a company, Instagram, which has 700 uh, million users. So it's a very, very big uh, Django application running uh, every day on mobile platform on everything. So it's a big, big project. It's fully written in Python. And they switched to Python 2 to Python 3. And thanks to this move to Python 3, they saved 12% uh, of CPU just by doing the change. And they also saved 30% of memory, uh, which is very some, something very important for them. Because when you have so many users, you need a lot of servers. And uh, at this <coughs> scale, as uh, the performance and a really really matter, it's really expensive to to have so much hardware. And um, if you if you didn't notice, um, Python two is a little bit old today, and um, even if we are doing our best to fix all bugs, sometimes we just we just cannot fix some some issues, because. Um, the thing with um, Python 2 is that it's called super stable because we have so many people w which rely on Python 2. It means that if you do any kind of change in Python 2, even to, to fix a bug, there is a risk to that someone rely on the current bug and all the, all the application rely on this bug. And um, so we we think twice when we have to, to backport a fix to Python 2. And sometimes it's more a design issue that has to require a big change in the language. For example, the first bullet is uh, Unicode. Uh, even if technically we could, we could try different options in Python 2 to, to have new warnings or new mode for Unicode, uh, we decided to not touch the current implementation of Unicode just because, uh, as I said, a lot of people rely on it. And uh, we, we cannot change anything because it would break too much code in the wild. Um, another example is that uh, for, for security reason, we decided to randomize the order of uh, items in a dictionary and in a set uh, object in Python 3. Because um, if you inject a specific keys in a dictionary, you, you may get the worst uh, complexity of the dictionary type. And in that case, you may crash the server just by sending a few bytes to an HTTP server. So, 
So what we what we did is to randomize the order, but uh, we cannot do that in Python 2 because if you change the order of the dictionary, the representation of a dictionary change, and it can break too many too many unit tests. So for your information, you have to explicitly enable uh, randomization using dash uppercase R to enable um, the workaround for the security issue. Another very annoying issue you know, of Python 2 is that uh, the subprocess module is not thread safe. So maybe you did not notice because you don't use threads, or maybe you did not notice because you're lucky. Uh, uh, but the idea of not being thread safe means that everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine, until one day on production you get a crash and nobody is able to reproduce a crash because uh, it really depends on the workload, it really depends on the order of operation. On, on your um, uh, developer laptop, you have different timings. So it's very common that race condition only occur on a production. So nobody wants to, to, have, uh, um, to rely on something which is not thread safe. So be careful with the subprocess. And uh, for your information, there is a backport called um, subprocess232 which backports the thread safe implementation. Another example is a recursive lock, which again is not uh, as a race condition, as a race conditions are not threads, but signals. It means that um, <coughs> if you use recursive lock and you get a signal, a uh, signal is for example that you spawn a, a process, and when the child process completes, you get a notification to say that, hey, your child completed, it's time to, to read the status, the exit status of the process. So when you get the signal, uh, you may get a race condition and your, your lock may become uh, inconsistent. So you, you may get a deadlock just because of a signal. And uh, this is really uh, annoying because a signal can come anytime. You don't, it really depends on the timing of the child process and you don't control the timing of the child process, so it's really dangerous to use a recursive lock on Python 2. And another example is that the clocks in Python 2 use a system time. So during winter time or summer time when you use a change of clock for DST, your application may crash just because of that. Or for example, if the system administrator decided to change the time manually, again, you may get a crash. And the solution for that is to use something called monotonic clock. So monotonic clock only, only increase. Yeah, there is no jump in the future or, or in the past. So the good news is that you just have to switch to Python 3 and you're, you're fine. So for example, for the time in, free, in Python 3.3, we, I added the time.monotonic function. And uh, slowly, we modified Python to use monotonic clock in, inside Python. And um, to explain you um, something else about Python 3 is that, as I said, Python 2 is super stable. We cannot touch anything. And the good thing with Python 3 is that it's still kind of um, not as popular than Python 2. So we can afford to make more, uh, more backward com incompatible changes. For example, I change how uh, file descriptors are inherited by, by child process. And uh, in, since Python 3.4, 3, when you spawn a child process, you don't inherit the file descriptor. It means that you didn't, don't inherit open socket, you don't inherit uh, the sensitive file which contains password or all your secrets. But this was a backward compatible changes, and we cannot do such change in Python 2. And uh, another example is that in, in Python 3.5, I made another change, which is to, uh, when you get a signal, uh, the syscall is interrupted, you get an error. And the behavior in Python 2 is that you get an exception and you have to do something. And in Python, Python 3.5 is that uh, if the signal handler doesn't raise an exception, Python will just retry the blocking syscall for you and you don't notice anything. You're just fine. And um, Guido Van Rossum, when he, he approved my change for the file descriptor in, in inheritance, he wrote that 
We are aware that the code breakage this is likely to cause and doing it anyway for the good of mankind. <laughs> and uh, again, Python 3 is much, much better because you have a lot of new modules in the standard library. I counted 21 modules for 3.7. And just to give you some examples, there is uh, AsyncIO for asynchronous programming. There is Enum for Enum, which is very useful. There is Passlib, which is very popular to manipulate paths. Uh, there is unitest.mock, which is a very, very nice way to, to reduce the dependency of a unit test on really test something very specific, so to mock another function. And um, not only we fixed bugs and we added new features, we also made changes in the language. And uh, for example, in Python 3.6, we added something called the f-string, it's a new way to format string, and in my opinion, it's just the best way to format string because it's very short, uh, it's very obvious when you read the string, and um, yeah, it's just the best because not only you can uh, format a variable, but you can all even call a method. You can, in, in practice, you can add uh, any Python expression. It just works, it's amazing. And uh, for asynchronous programming, we, we made different changes. First, we added the yield from. After that, we added async on await keywords. And uh, we also added support for asynchronous generators, so yield inside an asynchronous method. There are asynchronous list comprehension. Uh, but uh, you have also more, more um, changes, like for example, we have the keywords only arguments, which are very useful to write a better API. Uh, the prints uh, is no longer a statement, but it's a function, and uh, I really prefer to have this function. You can use the star to unpack, um, but, but also to, to, inside a list, now you can use a star, this is a new feature. It's a new way to build a list, and in my opinion, it's straightforward and uh, very useful. You can also do it for dictionary. Uh, you can use underscore inside numbers f to make um, numbers uh, easier to read. Uh, you can annotate the type of variable. Uh, for the with um, context manager with statements, you can add multiple uh, expressions. There is, uh, again, the bytes formatting. And there is something very useful for NumPy users. There is a new operator for ma matrix multiplication, which is at. It uh, avoids to, this is an infix uh, way to, for the matrix operation, because previously you had to call a function and it was uh, hard to read. So, I spent a lot of time to explain that Python 3 is way better. Uh, and uh, we are reaching slowly the deadline, which is in 2020, uh, the deadline of Python 3, uh, the deadline of Python 2. So the question is now, is it time to maybe bury Python, Python 2? So the good news is that uh, in Fedora, we already started to do that um, three years ago. In Fedora 2023, 20, uh, there is no Python 2 by default. There is only Python 3 by default. And in the, in the release of Ubuntu last year, there is, again, there is no Python 2 by default, only Python 3. And there is a Python 3 statement, which is a, um, a common timeline for all applications uh, for the end of support for Python 2 in their application. And uh, there are big projects like IPython 6 and Django 2, which dropped Python 2, Python 2 support. And um, I'm working for Red Hat, so for, you info, you, for your information, in the um, latest release of Red Hat 7.5, we announced that Python 2 is deprecated. So if, you, you f if your manager still have concern about Python 2, you can say that even Red Hat, which has a very, very <laughs> long support, <laughs> we, we, we are aware that something is wrong with Python 2, and we are working on that. And for your information, the next release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux will be Python 3 only. And um, if...
This is thanks to my very cool colleagues that were working on that for two years. And if you use uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS, uh, there, there is also something called software collections, which is a way to install the latest version of Python on your old system. So technically, it's already possible to use Python 3 on, uh, on Red Hat. And uh, one open question for me is that uh, we saw that uh, changing the syntax and changing Python was really difficult. So maybe we can try to, um, to handle this issue differently and maybe try the JavaScript issue uh, solution, which is to use transpiling using Babel and Polyfill. And by doing that, you are able to use uh, the latest uh, language on your old browser. And thanks to that, they are able to move way faster because you are no longer stuck by, by the version of JavaScript on uh, your browser. You can use new features. Okay, question? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, maybe. If there's, I've seen one over there. Just, just to come back to the latest slide, um, to be honest, I think that we understood that Python 3 was a, mis uh, a huge pain for everybody. And uh, if we do that one more time, we will not afford to break everything. And uh, my expectation is that Python 4 will just be the release after the previous Python 3 release. And we will follow the same deprecation process to have a slow process to give at least two releases uh, to remove something. So we are not going to break Python one more time. Uh, that's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> I just was wondering uh, whether the chart about performance was like generic case, because it puzzles me a bit. And the point is that from what I saw like around the internet, usually Python 2.7 performed faster on, on the general computing. But mm -hmm. is there like an usage of async or something like that which drastically changes the chart, or it's like the general case? Um, I spent a lot of time to work on benchmark um, because I wanted to optimize Python. So this chart comes from a, a project called Performance. It's a suite, a suite a benchmark suite. So I'm, I'm not sure that they are um, real uh, representative of real applications, but we are trying to be to use um, more complex benchmark to have a better idea of what is a Python performance. And what I just can say that on this uh, benchmark suite, Python 3 is always faster. So there is only one case where Python 3 is slower, is a startup time. But we are working on that, and uh, it's getting better. So I, I'm sure that in some specific cases, Python 2 is still slower. But the good news is that uh, this chart is for Python 2.6. It's an old chart. But uh, Python 3.7 is even faster. So maybe you should try the latest version of Python. Because okay. we, we optimized the um, method call and many other uh, small changes. Okay. One last question. Is there any? Huh? Okay. So um, knowing how the um, transition went, um, what uh, would you do differently if you could uh, do Python 3 again? Um, I tried to explain that uh, 10 years ago, the choice that we made was uh, the good way to do that. Because we didn't have enough information that we didn't know that we had so much users, we, didn't, we, we are not aware of the, the big dependency chain. So yes, if I, if I do that again, I would, what I would do is just to have a very smooth uh, transition to make sure that uh, even if we break something, we have a lot of time to port the code and not to push um, all backward and incompatible change at once, but do them one by one and make sure that we have the right tooling uh, to do the conversion, right tooling to detect issues in your code. Because one of the very difficult um, issues of Python 3 is that when you divide two, in two integers, you get a float. And this specific issue is really difficult to catch in your code because uh, just by reading the code, you don't know the type. 
So we we need more tooling to, to detect that and to help users. Okay, thank you so much.